Fenimore Cooper's Literary Offenses by Mark Twain It seems to me that it was far from right for the professor of English literature in Yale, the professor of English literature in Columbia, and Wilkie Collins, to deliver opinions on Cooper's literature without having read some of it. It would have been much more decorous to keep silent and let persons talk who have read Cooper. Cooper's art has some defects. In one place in Deerslayer, and in the restricted space of two-thirds of a page, Cooper has scored 114 offenses against literary art out of a possible 115. It breaks the record. There are 19 rules governing literary art in the domain of romantic fiction, some say 22. In Deerslayer, Cooper violated 18 of them. These 18 require... 1. That a tale shall accomplish something and arrive somewhere. But the Deerslayer tale accomplishes nothing and arrives in the air. 2. They require that the episodes of a tale shall be necessary parts of the tale, and shall help to develop it. But as the Deerslayer tale is not a tale, and accomplishes nothing and arrives nowhere, the episodes have no rightful place in the work, since there was nothing for them to develop. 3. They require that the personages in a tale shall be alive, except in the case of corpses, and that always the reader shall be able to tell the corpses from the others. But this detail has often been overlooked in the Deerslayer tale. 4. They require that the personages in a tale, both dead and alive, shall exhibit a sufficient excuse for being there. But this detail also has been overlooked in the Deerslayer tale. 5. They require that when the personages of a tale deal in conversation, the talk shall sound like human talk, and be talk such as human beings would be likely to talk, in the given circumstances, and have a discoverable meaning, also a discoverable purpose, and a show of relevancy, and remain in the neighborhood of the subject at hand, and be interesting to the reader, and help out the tale, and stop when the people cannot think of anything more to say. But this requirement has been ignored from the beginning of the Deerslayer tale to the end of it. 6. They require that when the author describes the character of a personage in his tale, the conduct and conversation of that personage shall justify said description. But this law gets little or no attention in the Deerslayer tale, as Natty Bumpo's case will amply prove. 7. They require that when a personage talks like an illustrated, gilt-edged, tree-calf, hand-tooled, seven-dollar friendship's offering in the beginning of a paragraph, he shall not talk like a negro minstrel in the end of it. But this rule is flung down and danced upon in the Deerslayer tale. 8. They require that crass stupidities shall not be played upon the reader as the craft of the woodsman, the delicate art of the forest by either the author or the people in the tale. But this rule is persistently violated in the Deerslayer tale. 9. They require that the personages of a tale shall confine themselves to possibilities and let miracles alone. Or, if they venture a miracle, the author must so plausibly set it forth as to make it look possible and reasonable. But these rules are not respected in the Deerslayer tale. 10. They require that the author shall make the reader feel a deep interest in the personages of his tale and in their fate, and that he shall make the reader love the good people in the tale and hate the bad ones. But the reader of the Deerslayer tale dislikes the good people in it, is indifferent to the others, and wishes they would all get drowned together. 11. They require that the characters in a tale shall be so clearly defined that the reader can tell beforehand what each will do in a given emergency. But in the Deerslayer tale, this rule is vacated. In addition to these large rules, there are some little ones. These require that the author shall 12. Say what he is proposing to say, not merely come near it. 13. Use the right word, not its second cousin. 14. Eschew surplusage. 15. Not omit necessary details. 
16. Avoid slovenliness of form. 17. Use good grammar. 18. Employ a simple and straightforward style. Even these seven are coldly and persistently violated in The Deerslayer Tale. Cooper's gift in the way of invention was not a rich endowment, but such as it was, he liked to work it. He was pleased with the effects, and indeed he did some quite sweet things with it. In his little box of stage properties he kept six or eight cunning devices, tricks, artifices for his savages and woodmen to deceive and circumvent each other with, and he was never so happy as when he was working these innocent things and seeing them go. A favorite one was to make a moccasined person tread in the tracks of the moccasined enemy, and thus hide his own trail. Cooper wore out barrels and barrels of moccasins in working that trick. Another stage property that he pulled out of his box pretty frequently was his broken twig. He prized his broken twig above all the rest of his effects and worked it the hardest. It is a restful chapter in any book of his when somebody doesn't step on a dry twig and alarm all the reds and whites for two hundred yards around. Every time a Cooper person is in peril and absolute silence is worth four dollars a minute, he is sure to step on a dry twig. There may be a hundred handier things to step on, but that wouldn't satisfy Cooper. Cooper requires him to turn out and find a dry twig, and if he can't do it, go and borrow one. In fact, the leather stocking series ought to have been called the Broken Twig series. I am sorry there is not room to put in a few dozen instances of the delicate art of the forest, as practiced by Natty Bumpo and some of the other Cooperian experts. Perhaps we may venture two or three samples. Cooper was a sailor, a naval officer, yet he gravely tells us how a vessel, driving towards a lee shore in a gale, is steered for a particular spot by her skipper, because he knows of an undertow there which will hold her back against the gale and save her. For just pure woodcraft or sailorcraft or whatever it is, isn't that neat? For several years Cooper was daily in the society of artillery, and he ought to have noticed that when a cannon-ball strikes the ground, it either buries itself or skips a hundred feet or so, skips again a hundred feet or so, and so on, till it finally gets tired and rolls. Now, in one place, he loses some, quote, females, unquote, as he always calls women, in the edge of a wood near a plain at night in a fog, on purpose to give Bumpo a chance to show off the delicate art of the forest before the reader. These mislaid people are hunting for a fort. They hear a cannon blast, and a cannonball presently comes rolling into the wood and stops at their feet. To the females this suggests nothing. The case is very different with the admirable Bumpo. I wish I may never know peace again if he doesn't strike out promptly and follow the track of that cannonball across the plain through the dense fog and find the fort. Isn't it a daisy? If Cooper had any real knowledge of nature's ways of doing things, he had a most delicate art in concealing the fact. For instance, one of his acute Indian experts, Chingachgook, pronounced Chicago, I think, has lost the trail of a person he is tracking through the forest. Apparently that trail is hopelessly lost. Neither you nor I could ever have guessed out the way to find it. It was very different with Chicago. Chicago was not stumped for long. He turned a running stream out of its course, and there, in the slush of its old bed, were that person's moccasin tracks. The current did not wash them away, as it would have done in all other cases, no, even the eternal laws of nature have to vacate when Cooper wants to put up a delicate job of woodcraft on the reader. We must be a little wary when Brander Matthews tells us that Cooper's books, quote, reveal an extraordinary fullness of invention, unquote. As a rule, I am quite willing to accept Brander Matthews' literary judgments and applaud his lucid and graceful phrasing of them, but that particular statement needs to be taken with a few tons of salt. Bless your heart, Cooper hadn't any more invention than a horse. And I don't mean a high-class horse, either. I mean a clothes horse. It would be very difficult to find a really clever, quote, situation, unquote, in Cooper's books, 
and still more difficult to find one of any kind which he has failed to render absurd by his handling of it. Look at the episodes of The Caves, and at the celebrated scuffle between Maqua and those others on the tableland a few days later, and at Hurry Harry's queer water transit from the castle to the ark, and at Deerslayer's half-hour with his first corpse, and at the quarrel between Hurry Harry and Deerslayer later, and at— uh, but choose for yourself. You can't go amiss.'